these diesel trains run very well when properly driven and maintained. But faults and failures do occur. With the help of two friends, driver Walter Drake here, and driver Mike Jones, we are going to show you a series of failures on the road, so that you will know what to do should you get in trouble yourselves. Walter's stuck all right. I wonder what's the matter. Possibly he does too. Now, the important thing is to get the train going again without doing any harm to it, of course, and with the minimum delay. And he almost certainly can, provided he knows certain things. It could be an airlock in the fuel supply, the operation of the engine shutdown solenoid, the compressed air system unloader valve at fault, faulty jumper cable connections. It could be a brake failure. And there are a couple of switches to watch as well. Now, don't be frightened. Failures only occur one at a time, usually. If you think things out systematically, it's all pretty straightforward. Let's go back and see what first happened to our friend. He was driving along happily enough when, good heavens, number two engine light has gone out. This could be serious. First, of course, make sure that the engine really has stopped by using the tachometer switch. Yes, no doubt about it. No, do not try to start the engine again while the train is still running. The throttle is wide open and the engine is still in gear. Besides, you should inspect the engine before trying to restart it. You've no idea what may have happened. At the first convenient stopping place, go and have a look at it. Before leaving the cab, remember to destroy the vacuum. Stop the other engine and make sure the compartment door is locked. You don't want some inquisitive schoolboy fiddling with the controls. Hmm, the engine seems to be all right. Try starting it from the local panel. But try only three times and pause for at least ten seconds between each attempt to allow the engine to come to rest. Sometimes the flywheel will go on rocking longer than this. No good. Something really is wrong. Next check on the engine shutdown solenoid. Yes, it has tripped all right. But suppose, just for a moment, that it had not tripped. The first thing then to suspect would be an airlock in the fuel supply to the engine. Here is the fuel pump and feed line. Open this vent. A penny will do. Prime the plunger to get rid of any air. Then close the vent again. But to get back to the solenoid. This trips whenever the engine is short of cooling water or the lubricating oil pressure is low. In either case, the engine should not be used until the oil or water is replenished. Just to check on the oil, there is a dipstick provided, but use only a clean rag to wipe it. Yes, the oil is low. So Walter must inform the guard and explain that engine and final drive have to be isolated. The train must be drawn up to clear the platform ramp. The platform would otherwise be in the way because the plunger of the final drive to be isolated is on that side the opposite side from a failed engine.
The rod for isolating the drives is kept in the brake compartment on these trains. This is the plunger with which the rod must engage. Insert the rod. Now pull out, rotate a quarter turn and let go. Quite easy really. So far so good. But the dog is still engaged with the final gearing and it must yet be locked in the neutral position. To do this, move the reversing lever to and fro. The dog will move likewise until the plunger drops into the slot on the dog. There, now the dog is locked clear of both gears. As a check, you must always see that the carden shaft is free to revolve, like this. Lastly, isolate the engine with the cab key. Whenever you have a failure like this, brief details must be reported at once to the depot through a signalman or a member of a station staff so that necessary action can be taken there. Back at the train, the guard waits until Walter returns and then gives the right away. Our friend is on his way again. It could happen to you and you must be able to act as Walter has done. Now, let's see what might have happened to him this morning. It didn't, but it just might have done. Oh, and it was so early too. This train had been stabled away from the depot overnight. Hello, something wrong here. Apparently no electrical supply to the control circuit. That indicator light would have lit if there had been. First check on the main battery switch. Someone may have turned it off. No, it's still in the on position. But Walter is not done for yet. He will have a try to regain control from the rear cab. Hmm, these jumper cables can be a source of trouble, but in this particular case it is most unlikely. Ah, there's a light this end, which means the controls in the front cab are probably working too. The cause of this trouble is usually a blown fuse between the main batteries and the power car controls. Walter has worked through the starting up drill from outside and is now returning to the leading cab. No, it will not move unless the reversing lever is properly in place. In fact, there is very little you can do with a train unless it is. Now to start up again. As the train moves off with Walter driving from the leading cab, you can see the control circuit key in place in the rear cab. As Walter goes on his way again, let's see how our other friend, Mike Jones, is doing today. He doesn't seem completely happy. I wonder what's the matter. Yes, something is worrying him. 
Wheel spin? No, it can't be that. Dry rails and a slight downgrade. But change up from second to third gear is certainly not 20 miles an hour. Must be gearbox trouble. For the time being, throttle back and engage the next highest gear, in this case, gear three. At the next stopping place, try to correct the fault. It's a slipping annulus brake band. Not so formidable as it sounds. First, stop the engines. Then select the faulty gear from neutral, or from any other gear for that matter. The air pressure needle dropping shows that the wear adjuster is at work in the gearbox. Remember, the dead man's handle must be depressed all the time to prevent the automatic return of the gears to neutral. You should do this at least six times. This is what is happening in the gearbox. You can see the slot turning as the adjuster nut tightens. Off once again. Up to second gear. Things seem to be all right now. Yes, that's the right change up speed from second to third gear. The brake band wear adjuster has done its job and everything is working correctly again in the gearbox. If you should ever hear any unusual noises or vibrations from the engines, Stop them for your own safety and check up on the cause. There's a great deal of very valuable equipment under the train and it's up to you to protect it from harm. Good heavens, fire! Well, first stop the train, of course. Now, let's not panic, me included. This is a bit unusual, but there it is, it's happened. Don't stop the train on a bridge or other unsuitable place. This is all right here. First, destroy the vacuum completely. Then, stop the other engine, turn off the control switch key and collect the extinguishers. The automatic extinguishers under the train emit a rather toxic gas, so it's a good idea to check on the wind direction. The automatic extinguishers are very efficient and nearly always deal successfully with an engine or flywheel fire by themselves. But if the fire should continue to burn, the guard should look after the passengers and go on fighting it with the other extinguishers while the driver goes off to protect the train. In this case, the fire has been promptly put at and there's a good chance that the controls will be unaffected, so that the train can continue its journey as far as the next station. But before Mike goes, there are several things to do. First, turn off the alarm bell. Then, isolate the engine. The flame switch is for your use, in case the automatic extinguishers happen not to have gone off automatically. Remember, it is important to conserve the other extinguishers if possible. It's most unlikely, but just in case the fire should break out again, the automatic ones are now empty and these would have to be used. See if you remember the drill for isolating the final drive. It's always isolated from the side of the train opposite to the disabled engine. Insert the rod, rotate the plunger a quarter turn, and let go. Now move the reversing lever to and fro. And finally, check that the carden shaft is free to revolve. Things seem to be all right. Slowly does it. 
Notice that no air light is showing. The isolation of any final drive is the only occasion when you are allowed to run without the air light showing. There's another train standing on the opposite line. I wonder if... Yes, it is Walter. Stuck again. Hmm, looks like trouble with the feed valve. Dirt or... or something. Yes, that's about all that could have caused the intermittent fault that Walter has just experienced. Just now, while driving along, the faulty valve caused this to happen. Walter didn't notice. He was checked by a signal and he made a normal stop. When he released the brake, only the usual 21 inches was registered on the train pipe. He was puzzled for a moment to find the brake still holding the train, but of course they were applied at 26 inches, and it'll take 26 inches to get them off again. Or will it? No, there's nearly always something that can be done. First, apply the handbrake. Then, pull the brake release cords their position is marked on the frame by the usual white star. Number one, under the power car front bogey. Number two, behind the power car rear bogey. Number three, by the trailer car battery box. And number four, the other side of the box. This has equalized the vacuum on both sides of the brake cylinders. Remember to take off the handbrake, but to avoid a repetition of the fault when you drive off again, release the vacuum brake and return it to the lap position as soon as the vacuum reaches 21 inches. The fault should be corrected as soon as possible, as it's most undesirable to run for any length of time with the brake in the lap position. Consider now the other failures in the brake system, divided into four. They may be in the high vacuum or train pipe in the power car, or the high vacuum or the train pipe in the trailer. Let's deal with each in turn. In each case, the power car is leading. Train pipe failure on trailer car. Whether the train becomes a failure really depends upon finding the leak. And it's not easy, as Walter is finding out. A few minutes ago, as he was driving along, he noticed the train pipe needle dropping, although the brake handle hadn't been touched, nor the communication cord pulled. There was obviously a leak on the train pipe, somewhere on the train. So Walter stopped, but left the engines running. In order to hear the leak, it was necessary to leave the vacuum brake off, so the handbrake had to be applied. The guard assisted by depressing the dead man's button in order not to lose all the vacuum in the train pipe. Good, he's found it. It's under the trailer car. In this case, the trailer car brake cords must be pulled, but first it is necessary to apply the vacuum brake. It would be pointless to pull the cords with the brake released and the engine still building up the vacuum. Now he must uncouple the train pipes between the two vehicles. and make sure that the disconnected pipes are secure on their dummy couplings. Black is the train pipe, blue is the high vacuum.
Now that the trailer car has no vacuum brake, the guard should have ushered all the passengers into the power car and must ride in the rear cab near the handbrake. The train can still be driven from the leading cab. Walter, don't forget the handbrake. High vacuum failure on trailer car. It's the high vacuum failure on the trailer car this time. Let's assume he's found it. No need to pull any cords, but the high vacuum pipes must be uncoupled between the vehicles and firmly secured on their dummy couplings, the blue ones this time. The train can again be driven from the leading cab, the power car cab. But first the high vacuum or reservoir must be recreated. Train pipe failure on power car. In this case, the train can no longer be driven from the leading cab. The power car is in front, remember. That's why Walter has his satchel with him. The cords must be pulled under the power car. The handbrake was applied before he left the cab. This situation involves some rules, but we'll come to those in a minute. The train pipes must be disconnected and secured on their dummy couplings. The vacuum supply is still available in the rear cab because it's obtained from the high side or reservoir, which is still intact. But the dead man system will be non-effective because the train pipes have had to be disconnected. So another competent person must ride with the driver in case he should become non-effective too. Luckily, there is a spare guard available, travelling passenger. When there is no spare member of the operating staff aboard a diesel train, disabled in this way, one must be picked up from the nearest station. The train guard must, of course, ride in the leading cab. The train is ready to move, he gives the driver right away by pressing the buzzer in the cab.
If something happened to the driver, the spare guard would use the emergency brake to stop the train. When riding in the leading cab, it's the guard's duty to watch all signals. Operate the warning horn when required. Communicate with the driver if necessary by the buzzer and apply the handbrake in an emergency. With this failure, the guard's emergency brake valve would be ineffective. Driven in this way, the train must run at a reduced speed and be taken out of service at the first opportunity. High vacuum defective on power car. This is the last of the brake failures. The high vacuum has failed on the power car which is still leading. There is nothing that can be done. Or is there? Well, yes. Sometimes it is at least possible to clear the running lines as can be seen here. Arrangements have been made to run into the sidings whilst Walter has pulled the brake cords throughout the train. The train must now be driven slowly into the sidings and the handbrake used to help control its movement and to stop it. It is possible for the driver to set the train in motion and then to move to the handbrake. There is no need to hold the throttle down as the dead man's device is non-effective. To conform with regulations, the guard must ride with the driver and in this case is operating the handbrake under the driver's supervision. The train is now clear of the running lines and the rest of the normal service can carry on uninterrupted. The handbrake must be fully applied after the train has come to rest. While we are in the front cab with both driver and guard, Let's just see the procedure, should the dead man's system ever become inoperative. When it does fail, tear off this perspex cover over the valve in the power car, then isolate the system with this lever. Afterwards, the guard must ride with the driver in case the driver should be taken ill. This is just not Mike's day, or Walter's either for that matter. The air pressure has been up to 95 all day, now look at it. First, check the unloader valve for a fault. No, that's all right. Not a siding for miles, not a hope of clearing the running lines, only one thing for it. Try to isolate both drives while there's still enough air pressure. The guard will have to go back to protect the train and fetch assistance at the same time. Mike has plenty on his plate. If the drives are not isolated, the train won't be able to move at more than 25 miles an hour and it's a hell of a long way. Hmm, the pressure's going. Now what? Oh yes. I wonder if he'll do it. If it drops below 50, the dogs won't move free.
good old Mike, he's done it. And with little enough to spare. Sometimes the only cause of an air leak is a faulty unloader valve. When that happens, remove the thread protection nut, then the blanking off cap screwed to a dummy bolt, and then screw the cap over the air escape hole. This brings into operation the safety valve set at three to five pounds higher than the unloader valve. Oh, they've sent Mike a steam engine. A disabled diesel train may be assisted by any type of train or locomotive providing certain precautions are taken. The fireman will couple up the engine. Meanwhile, Mike must explain briefly the cause of the trouble so that the other driver will know how best to handle the train. Only the screw coupling and vacuum train pipe can be connected. Isolate the dead man's valve where possible to avoid having to hold the throttle handle down all the time. Finally, the vacuum brake must be left in the lap position and all the other controls removed. Now the train is ready to move, but cautiously and at a reduced speed. The diesel train driver must now ride in the leading cab and signal to the driver of the steam locomotive whenever necessary. But suppose a diesel train turned up to assist instead. It looks like... Why, it is Walter. He's got himself another type of train too. I wonder what he's done with the other. Oh, never mind. Explanation as to the trouble is necessary in this case too. First, put on the screw coupling. These two types of train cannot be fully coupled because the control systems differ. Now couple the vacuum train pipes. The brake must be left in the lap position the other controls removed. And the dead man's isolated. The whole train will now be driven from this cab by Walter. But Mike must ride in the leading cab. Observe all signals, giving Walter the approved hand signals as and when required. And be prepared to stop the train in an emergency by applying the emergency brake. Cheerio, Mike. Cheerio, Walter. And a better day tomorrow. <laughs>